sovereignty, social contract, and natural law. I want to talk about <clears throat> these things, um, and 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 uh, this is a, a pretty big topic, but I'll just I just want to put, hit some particular highlights. <clears throat> And so we're coming out of uh, around the time that these things began to be written. And we're already into this phase of things, but I just want to, because of the, the connection here, I want to point out this historical foothold. Uh, remember that there's the Westphalian um, uh, Treaty, the Peace of Westphalia. Uh, at the end of the Thirty Years' War, which was the culmination of the Eighty Years' War, in which the Netherlands were intimately involved, and uh, during which the Netherlands were able to to establish, uh, at least uh, partially, their independence as a republican state. And we saw how there was some genuine republicanism. And it's out of this uh, background that William of Orange uh, arises as a Protestant hero and then uh, situates himself to become the uh, monarch of England, which then acquiesces ultimately to a parliamentary monarchy. So what comes out of the Treaty of Westphalia is the concept uh, clearly defined in many respects for the first time of, our, of the concept of a nation state that is sovereign, that once states have established a certain independence that they have a sovereignty, meaning that their borders and their uh, political integrity uh, cannot be violated without there being large scale uh, repercussions for the entire community of Europe. So, so that, you know, it's like, okay, whatever claims you have through these feudal uh, you know, intermarriages and, and claims from ancient times and all this to try to justify your warfare, um, that has to be weighed against on the ground actual sovereignty of a up and running uh, political unit. Um, and so this notion of sovereignty then is, is called into question because it isn't just rooted in monarchy and uh, sort of power plays and these traditional ideas. And we've seen that the whole feudal order had uh, by and large fallen apart by this point. So the Treaty of Westphalia begins to establish the new order of, of, of political units, how political units on the continent are to be conceived of because the old feudal way just isn't working. And the attempt to enforce that feudal order resulted in an 80 year long war. Um, okay, so they wrap that up. And then this idea of sovereignty is, is made um, prevalent in the minds of people. And one person who, who takes a close look at sovereignty uh, is Thomas Hobbes. Uh, in his book, The Leviathan, which is just, you know, a couple of years after the Treaty of Westphalia. Um, and what he wants to do is to establish the legitimacy of the monarchy. And remember, uh, I, I guess, significant here that I didn't put in the, in the outline here is in 1648 is when Charles is beheaded for treason against the parliament. And so that's all in the background. And Hobbes is an Englishman, um, you know, writing at the time that the English Civil War is just about to, about, just about to break out. And so Hobbes is writing a 
a treatise on what makes for sovereignty and what makes for legitimate power. Um, and so his argument is based in his notion of the state of nature. So he says, uh, before society emerges, human beings primitively were in a state, state of nature. And this state of nature is a war of all against all. Uh, so that it's just utter chaotic uh, warfare, warlord type warfare. And of course, to some extent, England had been familiar with that, with the, what up to this time was called the English Civil War, which was the Wars of the Roses uh, that I mentioned um, at the beginning of the discussion on the Reformation. Uh, up until this time, that was considered the English Civil War, and it was a series of wars, and it was a war of all against all. It was a pretty brutal warlord type, uh, chaotic uh, sort of warfare. And and Henry the Seventh is just happens to be the guy that's the last guy standing in this crazy free for all. And so what he says is that's the natural state of things, and that things can devolve into that very quickly. And in the coming years, you know, just less than a year after Hobbes publishes the Leviathan, Britain or England itself is in the midst of a, a civil war uh, of a kind of intensity that was unimaginable just a few years before. So Hobbes is very prescient and he kind of sees the civil war coming and that gains a lot, that, that lends a lot of weight to what he says, uh, especially in the minds of Englishmen living through the civil wars of the 1650s. Okay, so, um, or, or who had just li lived through, sorry, he's actually living in the wake of the civil wars. Um, they're still in progress actually at this point, but they had just seen the civil wars uh, in the 1640s, because it's at the end of the civil, you know, part of the ending uh, when Charles is beheaded. I had my date switch around. So he's writing in the wake of these civil wars. And so that lends a lot of weight to what he has to say about this state of nature, because everyone had just observed it, that society can collapse into a state of war. Uh, uh, a war of all against war, all. And remember that during these civil wars, there were actually four different armies fighting uh, within England, Scotland, and Ireland. Um, and so what he says is that in order to avoid that state of war or to come out of it, is that there's a social contract that is established. And this isn't something that's written down, but this is, a kind of, this is a, an agreement, largely a consensus among the people towards a sovereign. And the people give over certain rights and privileges of the natural existence. You know, there are natural rights, but the natural rights exist within a state of nature and the state of nature is war of all against all. And since people don't want to live in that state of nature, they give up some of their natural rights to a sovereign in who, who and, and the agreement is that the people give up certain natural rights to the sovereign so that the sovereign ensures that civilization is instituted and things do not fall into a state of war of all, all against all. Okay, so that's his basic argument. He makes a lot of, there's a lot of common sense um, weight to that, okay. Now he does conceive of the sovereign as an absolute and arbitrary sovereign. So he's arguing for absolute sovereignty. 
as in like an absolute monarchy, which the whole civil wars was all just about. So he's not, um, he's not necessarily on the side of the Commonwealth. He has monarchist royalist leanings. However, he does explicitly state that uh, the sovereign very well could be a parliamentary body. And there's nothing wrong with that. So that the parliament can, as it did uh, during the civil wars in England, the sovereign can be the parliament. The parliament can function as the sovereign. And it in fact did in the recent history uh, that was just lived through. So, uh, so that's perfectly fine with him and, and he, and so he, he incorporates the reality of what people had just lived through into his treatment. Um, but he's okay with absolute monarchy and in some ways thinks that that's uh, more effective. Okay. And so we have absolute sovereignty of some higher power and then the subjects, the citizens of a nation state are absolute subjects. They are put at the absolute discretion of a sovereign power. Uh, so he does a bit of having it both ways, making concessions to parliamentary control, but also making concessions and expressing royalist leanings. Okay, so we'll leave, we'll leave that at that. 